The festivities have already begun. We see a lot of exhibitions happening in the city and it's very very interesting to notice this year that the handlooms and textiles are picking up big time. Everybody is focusing on reviving the heritage, bringing back patola or probably ikat weaves and banarasi brocades and what not. Amidst all of the changing fashion scenario, we have today with us a veteran who has been working in textile revival for last 40 years. We have with us, ladies and gentlemen, Sally Holger. Welcome, ma'am, to the Thank show. You. Thank you so much. We are very excited to have you on our uh, weekly talk show called Canada Cicerone Live. And I'm honored to be here. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, to give you a little brief about Sally, Sally is a founder and chief trustee of Women Lead Charitable Trust. She co-founded Treva Society back in 1978, a time when there were probably 300 weavers in the Maheshwar region and she kind of tried to create education, awareness, training programs for them and create the market economics viable so that the people would be interested in continuing the profession of weaving. Back in 2003, she founded Women Weave, which has been working currently, and Women Weave is going to showcase in Amdivar on 13th and 14th with their exclusive collection made by the Handloom School. So, Handloom School was set up again by uh, uh, Sally back in 2015 to provide uh, vocational training, education to weavers and help them understand the design aspect, the marketing and the entrepreneurial aspect with it. So we have a lot of questions about all the things that you have been doing. I would love to answer them. <laughs> so let's begin from the start, Sally. A very primary question. First of all, what brought you interested into uh, uh, the craft sector and uh, 1978 Reva Society? How did that happen? So I married into the Holker family of Indore and they had an ancestral property in Maheshwar, which used to be the capital of Indore State, Brian right. State. And so my husband and I went there and it was all covered with bad droppings and cobwebs and spider snakes and spiders and we cleaned it out and we made it up into a habitable place to live. And we also then were walking around in that compound one day and a young man came to us with a sorry on his arm and he said, please can you help us? We are dying. <laughs> It still makes me cry. Okay. Right. Right. So he said, well, what can we do for you? We know nothing about weaving. From there, it got started. We got some funds. We opened up an old area, which had been the link auction of a Hegabai's palace compound. And we set up 12 rooms in the name of Rewa Society. Right. Rewa is the Sanskrit name of the Narmada River, which flows in front of our weaving center. So fast forwarding, we trained many women from that area. We set up schools for their children. And then I branched off and started something else which has to do with Kali because we're in a cotton growing industry sure. in the area. Sure. So uh, that's a long story long. Do you want to know more about this? Of course, yes. So so why you started Reva, let's go step by step. When you started Reva and there were I'm here, you know, this is about the inter yes. interviews that I've read that you've given. There were three hundred families at that point in time. What took you or uh, what what efforts did you have to take? to kind of change the behavioral mindset mm -hmm. of people to stay back uh -huh. in the villages and continue with the profession and what extra ancillary benefits could you provide for them in oh. terms of health care? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. It wasn't difficult to make them stay back because they had nowhere to go. <laughs> that was easy. It was more challenging to be able to give them sufficient income to improve their lives. Right? That happened rather quickly, I would say because we were able to give them steady work. Prior to women in Rainbow Society being there, they were at the whims and fancies of master weavers. If they needed something, the master weavers, then they got it done. If they needed nothing, then they felt no responsibility sure. to them. They were people sure. who outsourced uh, oh, from the work from the weavers, right? So these women began to get steady income. With that, we then set up a little nursery school. From that, we got funds and eventually set up a big school, okay. right? So their children were educated, the children who came with bare feet and hardly any any clothing on because they had nothing. Now look gorgeous in their outfits at the school and they got great shoes and socks and everything, very proud. And their mothers have had for years regular income, which has enabled them to save also, which is something that sure. never happens. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that kind of really helped them to kind of look at uh, 
the weaving profession also in a better way. It was obviously a weaver knows how to weave. They've done it traditionally. Yeah. But where you get the raw materials, how you set up the looms with what designs, and then of course the biggest question, where do you market those? Yeah. That was never in their purview. That okay. was always done by what was called the master weaver. Sure. So when we became the master weavers from India, then we shared all these things with them. Right. So that they had access to that information. So that maybe not those women we started with, but their children have become gone off and become small entrepreneurs on their own. Which but is fantastic. Which is great. Which is great. Yeah, which is fantastic. So then how did women weave start? What's the difference between the two organizations? So as as uh, Reva matured, I felt that I wasn't making breaking any new ground here or, or influencing or impacting anyone else in what had been a growing uh, number of weavers. And we were able to incorporate people from across the river. We we're based right on the Narmada River. Sure. So there were people from across the river and down the road and up the road who may not have been traditional weavers. This is an important point. Okay? Right. Yeah. So it you don't have to be a traditional weaver to be a great weaver. Right. You have to get it. How to, to learn it and love it yeah. also a little yeah. bit. And yeah. then obviously benefit from it. If right. you don't benefit from it, why should you do it? Precisely. So when there were now I would say maybe at least thirty to forty percent of the people weaving in Manish who were not from traditional weaving families at all. Right? So that's one good step in providing So it. was it okay for the weaving family to be okay with that? Like um, because it's a share of uh, Dividing in the It wasn't about dividing anything. It was about the fact that more the, the, the demand was greater. So the supply had to match that demand. Sure. The demand was greater because at Rewa we went on exhibitions, oh my god, all over the place. And we had what we called Rewa representatives in many of India's uh, main cities. So they kept their stock in their cupboards right. and they sold from their cupboards to all these people also. They were called Rewa reps. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. It was a good low cost way to do it and involved people in so many different cities. So the reputation spread because in those days, don't forget, no computers, no internet, no cell phones in those days. Right. Yeah. So what would be your training module when you started back in 2003, um, kind of getting these people who are not traditional weavers, uh -huh. get them into the weaving facility and kind of train them and skill them. Right. That's number one step. And yeah. then of course there's design intervention. So yes. how would you kind of do that? So first of all, money was also always an issue. Absolutely. So we got lots, we started a loom donation project. So people like Shabana Asmi and uh, oh, oh, lots of big famous people donated looms, which are still there with plaques on them. That, that covered the initial cost of the, of the enterprise, of the teaching. Right. And then how did we get ideas? What you always do is look for the past. Right. I gathered as many old Fatiwe saris as I could find, as many chindas as one could find, you know, remnants of things. And we got color combinations and layouts and things like that from those at the beginning. Thank goodness we had those because the traditional is always very, it sells well. Yeah, especially when it depends, the trends go up and down. But right yeah. now the trend is traditional. Traditional. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we had those traditional colors and layouts with us. Every border and every color in the Rahit Maheshwari uh, repertoire has a name. So then you began to refer to these as their names. Let's weave a Rewa border or a Narmada border or whatever, whatever. And then they became popular and that was great for the traditional story. Sure. The, the women without work, who were not traditional weavers, some were, needed income. So that's when we started Guli Guli. Uh, Women, 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 yeah. yeah, which was completely non-traditional. Khadi was never woken in Maheshwar at that time at all. Right? So that has started to open up whole other markets, which are, as you and I were saying, um, largely to do with not with saris or dupattas or anything like that, with yardages. Okay. Uh, because now the client has become not just the lady who comes to the uh, to the show, right? But the designer who's heard about you on Instagram. Yes. You know the whole story has changed. Uh, Designing, marketing, everything. Yeah. Sure, sure. So we um, hear, uh, we just spoke, sustainability is a new buzzword, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we are glad in a way that people are talking about it, you know. Um, of course, there are a lot of deep rooted uh, discussions that need to go <laughs> around what is sustainable actually. Yeah. But so that, that's where my one of the question is that. Um, 
plus designers love to procure a raw material from one particular region then get it woven in another region then dyed in a third region designed somewhere else yes. then stitched sewn somewhere else and finally marketed there's a lot of carbon footprint that is happening it's all very very it's, it's an expensive process yes. so how does the market economics work in such case so in our case we do almost all of those things in house so Which it's one it's one stop shopping right. at women weave women weave the cutting unit we at because also everybody in our staff is very tech savvy and so the whole whole thing takes place on whatsapp <laughs> you know okay from the photography to the procurement of raw materials to the design to the marketing everything is sort of low budget whatsapp kind of a thing when you're dealing at we are in the handloom school we're dealing with students who have come to learn to be business weaver entrepreneurs business weaver entrepreneur that means they already know how to weave they need to be no longer the servants and the slaves of their master weavers mm -hmm. right they are doing their own small business right for themselves so they need to understand every step of the way right so when we're procuring raw materials for them we're very careful and we keep them in the loop here's where you get this here's how much it costs here's how you process it all those things they are completely in the loop whereas a master weaver who was intent upon getting the maximum profit that would never share those details with the weaver sure right so sure. it's about empowerment empowering the people at the right level yeah. very much an overused word but we're actually good <laughs> Correct. Over usage of words in communication <laughs> is an issue right now. Yeah. Um, but um, I remember you mentioning about certain topic which we did not cover in this, and uh, you had some data with you about uh, yes. the minimum wages and the healthcare that you were talking yes. about. Yes. Um, when somebody talks about sustainable fashion label, yeah. you know what, according to you, would be an actually sustainable label, and uh, sustainable from what aspect? From Raw material to staff, employment. What all level are we talking about? It's such a murky question. It's such a murky. It's the whole the whole territory is very subject to definitions in many different ways. And I would say there's hardly anything which is going to be sustainable. Sure. In those definitions. Sure. Sustainable has to mean that there's hardly any transport uh, involved. It has to mean that it's all local. It has to mean that it's been made without because the cotton has been grown without fertilizers. All those. I mean, it's endless. Right. So you can never tick all those boxes. Right. You can try. Really. You can only try. You can try. And the truth in advertising is even tricky because nobody's going to sit and read a label that has five thousand words on it. You know. Yes. We yes. were true. We were telling the truth about the cotton, but not so much about the color right. or whatever. You know. Right. You can't say all that. So right. You, to, you have to use some yeah, buzzwords. And right. On. Yeah. And kind of take it from there. So handle school. Handle school. Such a fantastic and initiative. Realization of dream. Okay. Absolutely, I think it's one of the most fantastic yeah. initiatives yeah. that India has, yeah. and it's so heartening to see that there are graduates coming out of it. Please tell us more about so it. It's a baby still. I know school is over three, three years, years old. Three years old, yeah. And we have, I think, now students from eleven different parts of India, which in itself has opened up a dialogue between. One tradition and another tradition, one yarn and another yarn, one style and another style, which is not competitive. It's collaborative, right? right? So um, they collaborate at every level, helping each other to understand the business models and use them, helping each other to find clients, collaborating if there's like a big order. We recently had a big order. I can't remember where it was from. Uh, there was five of our different states who collaborated on that order. Just wow. imagine, you know. Wow. Again, what's happening? All happening on what's happening. So you think technology is playing a big part? Huge. It couldn't have happened otherwise. We didn't even have telephones when we first started. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And so WhatsApp is taking over. WhatsApp University that we talked about. That's a very negative way, is it? No, no. WhatsApp is enabling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, the handloom school when you started and the students, how are the how are the viewers kind of recruited for the process? You know, how how do you select them? Number one. Yes. Number two, what aspect of training is being provided to them, which we see normally the same. You know, because viewers would have they know how to be, they know how to be, but they probably don't know how to contemporize a design. Yes. They don't know how to market it. That's right. They don't know how where is the target audience. You know. So does handloom school do all of that? There are many other things they don't know, which we like, literally 
here is the address where you can WhatsApp this supplier and they will give it to you. They need details. All right. Here are the, here's where you find out the prices. Daily prices fluctuate on your office right. all the time. Here are the dye stuffs which are good but very expensive. Here are the other dye stuffs which are okay but cheaper mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. All those things are shared with them all the time and then they break their heads for things because their heads are used to weaving, yeah. not to calculating or anything like that. So they learn painstakingly how to do a budget, how to cost a product. Even you and I would have trouble with this one. Absolutely. All the different variables, yes. you know. Yes. How much profit you can add on, hmm. then how much discount you have to give to attract right. the client and all that. It's all very, very variable, all right. Time, right? Then they learn, again, the communications and they learn quality control. Now, probably all of us have had somewhat disappointing experiences of buying a beautiful sari, getting it home, and finding there's a small hole sure. in the middle of the yeah. yeah. Every one of these readers before they came to a, a, us would have said, I that, never mind. Now they would not allow that ever, ever, ever. Sure. Right? Sure. And that's expensive for them. Because if a small hole happens three meters into your six meter, you have to stop and take that out, it's expensive, and repair that whole thing and then keep moving on in weaving. So you have to learn that to make that sacrifice in the end will add to your profitability and your sustainability. Sure. Not easy. Not easy. Not easy when you're on a low budget. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Which brings me to two questions in Bhante Krishna, what you spoke right now. There was a recent article happening on Business of Passion mm -hmm. where um, I forget the author, but the author of, of, of has an organization which makes uh, clothes from India and it had a tag made in India. Mm -hmm. uh, expo uh, a fashion house in uh, Toronto was about to buy that yes. and they were in the order of information stage and when they saw the tag made in India, yes. they refused to process the order. They refused to process saying, citing the quality issue, saying that we do not kind of get into the order because we, uh, we do not get the right quality and hence we would not work. Right. I spoke to one of the other designers two weeks ago and she mentioned that in exports we have to be very sure about what quality goes out. My question to both of the topic is, are only international consumers discerning? Don't you think Indians are discerning enough? Absolutely. We deal with some of India's top fashion designers. Right. They're, they're more discerning. Yeah. They're more discerning because their volumes are much less. Right. So they can't afford even one little... Uh, one little disruption in that quality of every inch counts for them. Absolutely. Some of these big bulk buyers, okay, some of our biggest bulk buyers at Guri Muni, the Kali area, are from Canada. Okay, but they have been sustainable long before the term ever became. Right. They have learned, for example, to factor in a certain amount, a certain amount of, okay, I'm used to make fabric, but they were early in the game. You must all of you be seeing on what's happened everywhere, how to recycle things and how to reuse them. Okay. Make tote bags out of remnants and you know the things you have to cut up, all that stuff that you yeah. do. Yeah. They were doing that ages ago, Myra yeah. in Vancouver, Canada, right? So we all have to learn to do that because if you've got a big order and it has a deadline and all that, you can't send it back. Sure. You cannot. Sure. You lose your reputation, right? Absolutely. However, they now have many more alternatives than they used to have in terms of producers. So we may be there, but there are many other very good units which are standing there also. If we let our client down too often, they have they have other places to go Absolutely. down. Right? That's great. That's great for all concerned. Right. Yeah. So um, sympathy or pride? What should be the selling narrative? Understanding, not sympathy. Okay. Right. Understanding would be a better empathy. word. Empathy. Empathy and great pride. And a great, if possible, effort to really interact at the most grassroots level you possibly can with them. And that's what our best buyers do. They once, once in their careers, they will actually go visit some of the places where the rooms are. And that's when they really get it. Right. That's when they really get it. It doesn't mean that they accept more readily defects or anything like that, but they are less angry about it, less tough about it, you know, somehow the other they learn to make it work. Yeah. Do you think consumer education is still required? Because most of us do not even realize what long process does it take to even create that basis. Yeah. This beautiful uh, dupatta that you're wearing right now, right. 
Um, and I'm sure it's over at Women Day. Yes. Uh, how long would it even take to kind of design and make and all of that? It's a lot process. You start with the design, then you procure the yarn, then you dye the yarn, then you set up the loom, then you why up and takes it takes ages. It's a, it's a, it takes ages. So it represents much more than just what it looks like right now. Which most people can't factor in. But your question was? My question was basically that um, uh, when people kind of buy handloom products, mm -hmm. do you think more awareness needs to be raised at how the process is made? Yeah, know? and I think that's happening. You probably follow Instagram. Absolutely. At many different levels, not yes. just textiles. I yes. follow it at textiles. I'm so happy, so relieved, so proud. Yeah. Um, that it attracts enough attention now that you have you have sites dedicated to explaining the dyeing or the weaving or the setup or the quality control. There are many, many sites which are excellent about that. Do you think um, um, there, there's this now new surge, you know, um, Ali started, Ali Muffin started 100 Sari Pact, uh -huh. you know, four years ago. Uh -huh. And then since then, it's been four or five years when the Sari, not Sari, hashtag has been going on. Uh -huh. People are wearing a lot of Sari. Yeah, yeah, in different, you know, different ways. In different, so different ways. ways. Yeah. Potter and Paul did an amazing, that like, 100 uh, yes. trade book thing. Yes. Do you think that is also helping of people? Of course, because it makes it fun. It gives it flexibility, you don't have to look like your grandmother. Yeah. You can look <laughs> like, you know, that very, very cool. You're a rock star wearing a sari now also, you know. So, the, yeah, the, the flexibility of a sari is tremendous. Or even of a dupatta or even of a piece of cloth. Right? Right. right. So, permission to do is now out there. Right? Yeah. All yeah. These so, people are getting it more and more acceptable. Yeah, and the weavers are, I mean, look, look at the lines in yeah. this thing. Yeah. If they know ahead of time that this girl is going to wrap it like that, they can adjust the line so they fall in just the right place. Absolutely, so, you know that yeah. kind of interaction is very possible. Yeah, that's that's yeah. interesting to know. Uh, so with the handloom school, going back to the handloom school, I think a lot of collaborations have happened till now. You know, yes. you work with a lot of big designers yes. across the country. Yes, I think Udard from Gore in uh, Ahmedabad, we had so on the way, and yes. Yes. Tila, yes. and yes. Raw Mango, and all of it. Yes. What do they bring to the table when something like this happens? Oh. First of all. They break that artificial barrier between designer and weaver. And they've all just become ghosty ghosty and there's lots of dialogue. So first right. of all, it's a, a general relaxation in the whole relationship. Right. Then it's an understanding, highly scaled up understanding on both sides. We get we get designers who come and say, Oh God, I have no idea that I could have done this and that on the loop. And then they start planning and then they do this and that and then they've got a unique garment because it's like on the moon. Right. And the weavers are like, I didn't know that they'd like to have transparency somewhere, and, uh, you know, non-transparency somewhere, and we can do that. Or the the exchange of information between the weavers from different areas, like Kutch and West Bengal, how did they ever do it before? They never did. Right. Kutch, West Bengal, and Ladakh. Right. Okay. What can they do together? Okay. Right. The dog works with wool. Right. So you can make a piece of fabric in which there are just little ex insertions of wool in there, right? Now what happens? Wool shrinks when you wash it. So you design for shrinkage. So you've got a crinkled look in there. Why? Because the dot had cutch, and cutch meant less been bought. And we got some booties in there and some different textiles in there, yarns. And then we had a post weaving process that created magic. It is such a beautiful interaction and innovation that happens, right? Yes. Yeah, and it's constantly surprising. Nobody can predict because it's never been done before. Wow. You know? So how many students have graduated from the Handel School by now? 118 have graduated. Of 50 were women, which is pretty good. And in our next batch, we have solid women backstrap bloom weavers from Assam. Wow. Now, what can backstrap do? Handbags, um, jackets, uh, you know, like belts and things like that. But they've never thought of that. They've been making the same old all their lives. You just wait, there'll be a revolution in Assam in wow. another six or eight months when they learn how to do all these things. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. So um, while you were working with the viewers from 78 till now 2019, what is the major shift that you've seen in the behavior uh, pattern, one of consumer and two of the viewers? Weavers, the major shift is flexibility. Fear of not being able to feed your kids creates a certain inflexibility, which is just based on, I know how to do this, so I'll just do this. And I'll be sure of earning 100 rupees. Mm -hmm. Now, with 
with confidence of knowing that you're going to get your money, even if you take a risk and you create something alternative. There's great flexibility. Great flexibility, great willingness to experiment and things like that. And great willingness to bring your children into this, even if you kind of hope that they grow up to be president of some major company or something like that, sure. which they will not, right? But previous things I wanted to keep the kids away from. So that they wouldn't even be attracted by that. They would rather have had them go and be peons in the door at some big company than be a weaver. Now it's very clear that you can do much better as a weaver than you can as a peon. Sure, right? Sure. So um, and the, the, the topic that we had was the same that when the artisans' uh, children would want to become artisans in future, you know, viewers. So what do you think artisans about it? still live in very close uh, extended families. Right. And they generally will do what their parents want them to do. Hmm. In some cases, particularly in Maheshwar now, that there's quite a history. There's a 40-year history of success in weaving. The parents want them to go and be a peon somewhere. Uh -huh. They're like, Nani, I'm going to do it. We're oh, going to do it. We're staying right here. Because we can, they can be entrepreneurs. They're earning much more money. Much more money. Is there a change across the board, across India? No, I don't think so. Because uh, insecurity creates rigidity in something. So, a lot, particularly in West Bengal, which has so many weavers, right. right? And it's less entrepreneurial, for example, than the Kutch area right. and the Kodi Gujarat area. Those right. guys have just got magic fingers, magic brains. They know it all. They are entrepreneurs from day one, right? So a lot of people from West Bengal sit there, sit there silence against their will sometimes. To do, to do road work or building work in Gujarat or something like that, mm -hmm. just imagine, mm -hmm. right? When they could have stayed on, and West Bengal weavers are have magic in their fingers also, but they didn't have anyone interacting with them. Sure. And that's slowly speaking. That's happening, and not just yeah, us, yeah. Yeah. Also. So it would be better for them if they stay, if they sleep, unless they're highly educated and could really get a good, good job. But do you think the Handle School needs to be replicated and it yes. needs to kind of go more? Oh, yes. Because definitely. I feel that is the only thing that yes. will kind of prevent these guys from not job. No, they were actively English. working toward that. See, our problem is we can only teach in Hindi right. and English. Right. 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 So that's good only in certain areas of India, not everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're working on one in the south. Working on means people approach us that would you work with us to start a handle school there? We're like, yes. Definitely. Right. We need one in the south, definitely. And probably in places like Orissa and that area. There's a lot of craft that's still Oh, Orissa is fantastically talented also. Right. And way behind in most things. Sure. With all due respect to others. Right. No, no, no. Of course, of course. Yeah. But um, so what, what is the place of the wages that is happening um, um, in terms of weaving and craftsmen and artisan? We kind of see a lot of um, um, NGOs working, of course, with the weavers yeah. and the craftsmen and um, of the, the share of money that right. is given to the weavers and right. the craftsmen and the profit that the designer makes yeah. has a lot of disparity among it. How does one decide what what is so uh, I can't order? answer for everyone. Right. We have a we have a policy of total transparency with whoever we're working with. They know what our costs are, they know what our markups are, they know what the wages are. Then when we say to them, we have to charge you this. Right. And so then by us they don't ask for discounts anymore or anything. Now what other people do, I don't know. I know other small NGOs, there are many around India. I don't know what their policies are. I would, I would imagine that they're very similar to ours. NGOs have a, a big stake in transparency. I right, think, you know? right. But that transparency leads to trust, and trust leads to good business, right? So, and because of Instagram, because of the internet, all these buyers are aware of the challenges, the costs, everything. All the information is out there. Right. Now, so for the weavers and the craftsmen also, what I'm saying is about their comp compensation that goes on to the weaver and the craftsmen. Uh, how is it decided? Uh, that's very, very individual to different areas. Like, I would like, I don't want to name particular no, areas, okay. yeah. but there are some areas where the grasp of the master weaver is so much that his weavers will live and die, and their sons will live and die in debt because the master weavers keep them in debt. They keep them in debt because I have, that's how we keep them. So they need a loan for the shadi. They need a loan because father is sick or something like that. They know. 
but then at what interest they can't even calculate the interest themselves. Right. So these weavers continue getting some kind of wages, but they're always behind. They're always behind. They're always in debt. Sure. Now that is not going to change in this generation. That will change as more and more we work goes directly to the weavers and not to the middlemen. As a big middleman, I mean, I won't name his name, but I know one of the people who owns one of the biggest chains of sari stores in India. Sure. A very frank person who sympathizes with the weavers. He says, we are the worst. We take advantage of everything we can. And now we're not able to do that so much. Yeah. I was thrilled to that. Yeah, which is good, right? Like, at least it is happening. Finally. They're going to have to adjust their business models also. Sure. Yeah. Social media has really helped in that. Social media has really helped, right? So does digital training, uh, is digital training given to these guys at Hanlon School? Oh, definitely. On their handsets. They all walk away with a handset and they spend six months practicing on the handset. Take this photograph, photograph your product, tell your story, right? Tell your group story, have fun, sing a song for everybody, show them how you're putting in this booty. They're doing all that. They love it. Which yes. is so cool. They're laughing and working. Yeah. <laughs> Great. We are so excited that you're doing the Hanlon School. Come and visit. Everybody Absolutely. Come and visit. We yeah. would be very excited to come that. and visit. I mean that. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much, Sally, for a lot of inputs that we could get oh, today. Sure. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. And for everyone who's uh, enjoyed the interview with uh, mm -hmm. Sally, please do come on 13th and 14th. Women Weave is displaying the most fantastic festive collection, which has been created specially by the Hanlon School graduates. You have to see it to believe it. And some of the weavers will be there and they'll chat with you in English. <laughs> oh, wow. That is going to be so cool. That's going to be so good. Thank you so much everyone. If you like the video, please do like, share, subscribe and comment on it. We will be back again next week, Wednesday with another guest. And this one too is really exciting. So wait for it. See you next week.